It's 2020, so it's only natural that we talk about having 2020 vision. Last Sunday, we talked about having a vision for the rest of your life. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about having a vision for your family. But today, I want us to talk about our church, First Baptist Church of Alexandria. You know we are in uh, exciting days, and we've got to be ready for the challenges and the opportunities that will surely be coming our way in the days to come. If you're a guest, there is a listening guide in your program. If you learn by writing things down, that's there for you. We have children in the room this morning because of J term, and that's kind of changed up our schedule a little bit. They're here, and they have a certain set of questions they're listening for, so help the children to listen well, and they'll get the message today. My text is Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. And I want us to look at chapter 1, verse 24 and following. It'll be up on the screen, but you follow along in your own Bible if you have one with you. Verse 24, now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. In the New Testament, a mystery, it's not like Agatha Christie. It's not something hidden that you've got to search out. It's something that has been hidden, and now God has revealed it. And Paul is about to reveal one. Verse 27, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. Here it is. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. God's word for God's people today. My wife enjoys putting together jigsaw puzzles. The 500 to a thousand piece jigsaw puzzles. Sometimes we'll be watching television and I'll see that she's put up a table and she's opened the box and poured out all these hundreds and hundreds of pieces. I can't do jigsaw puzzles. My nose is in a book. I'm reading. I'm half watching television, half reading. She's looking at every individual piece and picking out the border and then filling it in. She enjoys it, but I've never been able to do it. And so that's been a solitary exercise for her until over Christmas, our son and his wife were visiting and uh, she discovered that our daughter-in-law, Daniela, also loves jigsaw puzzles. So now she's got somebody to play with, somebody to do those puzzles with. Daniela learned that from her mother. And so we've decided the next time her mother comes up and she doesn't speak any English and Audrey doesn't speak any Portuguese, they can do puzzles together. So I'm happy for them. You know, you take those little pieces and you feel them and you look at them and you compare them to the picture on the box top and gradually you fill it in and you've got a picture, something beautiful. Life is kind of like that, isn't it? I mean, a big jigsaw puzzle and we're trying to put all the pieces together. When I think about our church, our church is like a jigsaw puzzle and you're one of the pieces and we're not complete until you're in place, till you're here, till you're a part of it. The decisions we make as a church, the way we approach the future, it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. And we've been working on our campus now for many, many years. And with the completion of the sanctuary in a few months, most of our dreams for buildings will be complete. That jigsaw puzzle will be in place. But now we've got the jigsaw puzzle of what kind of ministry we're going to have. What are we going to be doing? And I know this, once we enter our new facility and we have much more space for classes and for worship, we're going to be reintroducing ourselves to the city of Alexandria. We're going to invite them in and we're going to listen 
to what their needs are. And as a church, we're going to do our best to represent Christ in this place. God's giving us a facility to help us do it. So obviously there will be uh, some change, greater opportunity, fresh enthusiasm, but yes, change takes place. Not in our message, but maybe in the way we do some things. What is our ambition for First Baptist Church in 2020 and beyond? We want to build, it's written there in your notes, look at it, and maybe mark it up. We want to build a stronger church in Alexandria so that we can go and make disciples in our city, our nation, and all the nations of the world. We're building a stronger church, not just a facility, but a church that is stronger. Building a stronger church in our city with a purpose, not for ourselves, but with the purpose of going to make disciples locally, nationally, and around the world. Now, our text is going to speak to that, so look at it. And the first thing I want us to see is that as a church, as First Baptist, we have a common experience. We're different in so many ways, but we have one thing in common, a common experience. It's not verse 7, it's verse 27. Look at chapter 1, verse 27. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that little preposition in is vitally important. It's not just Christ among you. It's not just Christ in our imagination or Christ as a tradition of our past. It is Christ in us, literally in you and in me. Jesus is now your contemporary. He's alive and he lives inside of you. And when that truth grabs you, it has to make all kinds of difference in the way you live, the way you approach everything. If Christ is literally in you. I remember the first time this verse ever became real to me. It was very, very early in my ministry. Jack Taylor very prolific writer back in those days, wrote a book about the triumphant Christian life, and he focused on this one verse. He said, Christianity is Christ in uity, Christ in meity. It's Jesus literally living in us. Remember the story of Zacchaeus in the New Testament? Jesus and his entourage were coming through town, and uh, he's being greeted by all the dignitaries. And he looks up in a tree, and there's the little man, the wee little man, Zacchaeus. And Jesus stops and looks up at him and says, Zacchaeus calls him by his name. And everybody loves to hear their name being called. Zacchaeus, come down. I want to have lunch at your house today. And Zacchaeus shimmied on down that tree, welcomed Jesus to his mansion, his palatial mansion, which he had purchased with ill-gotten gains. He was a tax collector and he was on the take. And so he had a, quite a mansion to entertain Jesus in and luscious food to eat. But while they were there, Jesus gripped his heart and changed him. But he went home with Jesus, Zacchaeus did. Now think about this. You're going to go home with him too. Today when you leave and you go to lunch, you're going with Jesus too. Because he lives inside of you. He's not just in the car. He's not just in the restaurant or your home. He's literally inside of you. So Christianity is simply allowing Jesus to live his life out in you. Just let Jesus be Jesus. He wants to do today in your body what he did in his physical body walking the earth. And you get to be a part of something miraculous and wonderful. Now, that's our common experience. And it's our experience by putting our faith in Christ. You don't have to know a lot. You don't have to know much. You don't have to be a deep theologian. All you need to do is open the door of your heart and life and invite him in. He comes in by invitation only. He won't force himself on anybody. So today, you could simply say, Lord, I believe in you, and I open the door of my heart to you. Come in and live in me, and that will be your hope of glory. That is our common experience. 
Now, we give a clear expression to this faith of ours. This is what our church is going to be doing. Always has done it, by the way, but we're going to do it with even greater intentionality. Number one, we proclaim Jesus. We proclaim Jesus. We preach Christ as our message. Now, we talk about a lot of things here. We talk about subjects that hopefully are relevant to you, and that will continue. But no matter what we're talking about, whatever the theme of the day is, underlying it all is the gospel of Christ. You'll hear it every Sunday as the gospel is being proclaimed. Christ is in me, and I am sharing him with you by proclaiming his story. We do it on Sunday mornings. We do it at other special services. We do it at funerals. You know, I've discovered that people listen at funerals. I'm not always sure you do on Sunday mornings. But I know if you're at a funeral, you're listening because you never go to a funeral that you're not thinking about your own. There's something about that casket at the front of the room that focuses the mind And you're wondering about eternity. Everybody does. And so if I can preach a brief message laying out the gospel, it can make a great deal of difference. We do it at funerals. We do it at weddings too. Here's the couple. They're they're speaking their vows. but, But we always try to put the gospel in there because they're building their marriage. They're building their life on the solid rock that is Jesus. And you make promises to each other just like you're making a promise to Jesus, committing your way to him. And when you get married, it's exclusive. You're you're turning away from everybody else toward each other. And when you give your life to Christ, you're turning to him away from everything else. So we proclaim Jesus. We proclaim the gospel. And then we do something else. We teach the faith. There's a difference between exhortation and inspiration and challenge and teaching. We teach the Word of God. We do it on our campus, Sunday by Sunday, and off our campus. We've been operating the last uh, couple of years with very limited facilities, as you know, and that's going to get better, but in the process, we are expanding out more and more to other days of the week, not just Sundays, but now other days of the week where we meet together in small groups so that we can grow in our faith. We we do some mentoring. That's older Christians, either chronologically in age or older in the faith, teaching younger people the faith, passing it on. And here's the beautiful thing about our church. It's not true in a lot of places. We are really multi-generational. We, we have all ages. Some churches focus on one particular age group, and that's fine. That's their ministry. But ours is to minister to all these age groups. And so you look around, you see it in the room today. Children, teenagers, young adults, older adults, we've got them all. And so what we're doing primarily in J-term, we're kind of shaking things up for the month of January, mixing older adults with younger adults and everybody in between. And all I know about is last week. I haven't heard the report yet from today. But what we discovered last week is there are people in these classes meeting people they never have seen before. And they've been coming for years. They're meeting people in different age groups. The older people are passing on their wisdom. The younger people are passing on their energy and enthusiasm. But we're growing together. And that is a beautiful thing. Turn to Titus, right after Thessalonians and Timothy. Titus, in chapter 2, this has always been the mission of our church. To preach, and Paul said he determined to preach only Jesus and him crucified. Paul was very well educated, could speak probably many languages, had his Ph.D., but he said, I'm only going to preach Jesus. That's what I'm going to talk about. And Jesus crucified. And then he lays this out as our, as our discipleship ministry. Chapter 2 of Titus, verse 1. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. 
Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home and to be kind, to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. This is how it goes from generation to generation. And so your children are in the room and they're, they're watching you worship and sing and pray. The faith is being passed down. We do it on Sundays. We do it during the week. I saw a statistic this week, and uh, I shouldn't have been shocked but because it's similar to what I've heard in recent years. It just seems to be getting worse. The latest statistics say that 50% of Christian churchgoers, and that's you, 50% of those who are in church on Sunday only come to church one Sunday out of four in a month. Now, you think you come more than that, but check your calendar. How, how is it with you? How often are you here? We need to be together more and more as we see the day of Christ approaching. We need this so we can pass on the faith to one another. So we preach and we teach. And we do this with a confident expectation. A confident expectation. Look at verse 28. He is the one we proclaim and admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that, here's our expectation, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Our expectation as we go about our ministry is we're going to help people, every person we encounter, become a fully developed, fully mature disciple of Jesus. Now, we don't, we don't see it happening. We don't see it, uh, the change on a day-by-day -day basis. But on a year-by-year -year basis, we ought to be seeing it. Maybe at your house you do this. Or maybe you bought a house and you saw in some back pantry or closet some pencil marks on the door with dates written beside it. You know what that is? That particular family once a year or periodically has brought in the children and they put their backs up against that door, their heads back, and they've marked their height and dated it. And then as the years go by, parents can see what they cannot see day by day. They see how their children are growing. And we, we want to measure that. We want to see how you are growing year by year in your faith. What would it look like to have mature disciples. What does it look like? Three things I would mention. There, there are many others, I'm sure. A real disciple has a missionary passion. A missionary passion. We care about reaching the world for Christ. And that's First Baptist Church. We have teams throughout the year going. We pray for missionaries regularly. And we give our money by the hundreds of thousands of dollars to carry that message. You haven't heard this yet, but the Lighty Moon Christmas offering we do in December and we carry it over into January, so it's even not finished yet. Our goal this year was $200,000, and at last count, we're at about, Wayne was telling me, $198,000. We'll probably meet that goal today. If, you'll, if you've not given yet, if you'll put yours in, We'll go over our goal. We're not taking our eye off the prize, which is sharing Christ with the nations. Also, a disciple has a genuine concern for those Jesus called the least of these, Matthew chapter 25. The poor, the hungry, the naked, the sick, the prisoner, the stranger. We see Christ in them, and we want to minister to Jesus by ministering to them. We have a heart for people in need. We don't turn away from them. And a disciple has a certain demeanor as she moves through this life. 
She carries herself in a certain way. He does too. He walks a certain way. And I want you to look at Romans. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, which is a fabulous chapter in the Bible. I want you to look at chapter 12, verse 9 and following. 12, verse 9 and following. And just mark some of the words that describe a Christian's lifestyle. Verse 9. Here's the very first one. Love. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Has your spiritual fervor began to lag? The flame died down. Paul would say in another passage, fan that flame. Keep it going if it's diminished any. Keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord. Be joyful. There's one. Be joyful in hope. That's one. Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. There's one. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. And you can even read on, there there are more words to come. This is how we should be described. So that when your neighbor or your coworker, your friend looks at you, they think they're looking at Jesus or a close approximation of Jesus because we live the way he lived. How will we accomplish this? If this is our goal to build a stronger church and to teach and preach the faith and to live this way as his people How will we accomplish it? The last verse in chapter 1. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Remember, you're not alone. You're not doing this in your own strength. It's Jesus in you, the hope of glory, and he gives you the energy. He fills you with the strength to go about his work. I want you to commit yourself to that. It's going to take you giving all that you have for Christ to do all that he wants to do in you and in me. So the first part of every day should be given to the Lord. Meet him in the morning. The first day of every week should be given to the Lord in Sunday worship. The first part of your salary should be given to the Lord in tithes and offerings. And the best, the first of your energy should be given to the work of God. Not the leftovers, but the best you have in service for the king. Bob Russell tells of a reporter who asked his African safari guide, is it true that ferocious wild animals won't bother me if I carry a lighted torch? And the African safari guide replied, well, that depends on how fast you carry it. We're running a race. Let's run the race set before us, carrying that torch, carrying that fire of the gospel. I'm committed to it. I want to see it happen this year, and I believe that it will. Pray with me, please. We're going to sing in a moment. I'm going to be at the front of the room, and I invite you, if you've never professed your faith in Christ, to do so today. If you've been coming week by week but have not joined our church, It's a jigsaw puzzle piece that's been missing. And that's so frustrating, isn't it? When a piece is missing, you come to the end, you've got it all but one or two pieces. We invite you to come and unite with us. If you want prayer, come and we'll pray for you. Father, speak to every heart and every life and call people to yourself. We surrender all that we are to you today and this year for your use. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing.